Hello, this is Brett Hayworth with the Sioux City Journal. I'm joined today by Paul Gossman, the superintendent of the Sioux City School District. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Of course. Um, and we're going to have a conversation about uh, the many changes that have impacted the school year here in Iowa, at not only in Sioux City, but all, all the Iowa schools. Basically, since school has not been held since March 16th, I believe. That's right. That was our day. first day yeah. that, that we were closed. Yeah. And I wanted to ask to get started, um, Dr. Gaussman. Um, we're about so the third week of April, right. which would typically be about five weeks left in the school year. What would it be like normally at this time of the year? What, like, what would you be doing right. as, yeah, you, well, as you wind down the year, and then what's it like now? Yeah, by this time of the year, we would have finished our third quarter of instruction already. We'd be well into the fourth quarter of instruction. All three of our high schools would have had their prom dances by now. We would be well underway with a number of sports activities that are going on. Uh, uh, arts and, and other activities as well would, would continue, uh, and obviously the daily instruction that goes on. But uh, you know, when we, we left the district on March 13, that was a Friday, fully expecting to be back on March 16th, the Monday, and we're surprised to learn uh, on Sunday night that the governor had closed schools. And so uh, when, it, and what, what I think is so important about that is our staff members, when they said goodbye to the students on that March 13th, thought they were gonna see him again on the 16th. Our students, you know, think of our high school seniors, didn't realize on March 13th that would be their last time in that building. Uh, and so uh, I'm not critical of the governor for making that decision. We just thought she was gonna make it about a week later. And so uh, it really created a, uh, a quick change in the way that, that we're doing things. And since that time, we've put a number of systems in place to try and continue education and other services in our community. Right, and um, just describe, I don't know how often you talk to a teacher on a daily basis or maybe, maybe do sure. a lot, emails yeah. or meeting mm -hmm. them in person. What, what's the mood of the teachers you know, in the, over this time that they haven't been you know, yeah, in class? Yeah, I've been really impressed with our teaching staff and all other staff. Our food service staff is just some, I mean, they're heroes at the moment in my, in my opinion, the way that they're, they're always heroes, but at the moment they're really going above and beyond. Um, you know, Sioux Cityans uh, are used to coming, overcoming adversity, you know, whether that's a, a plane crash of many years ago, or a flood, or, or whatever. Sioux Cityans find a way to get through it, and our staff is no exception. They, they have done so many incredible things for voluntary continuous learning, or for serving meals. Within 17 days of meal service, uh, we had served over 100,000 meals in this district. Uh, and you know we still continue that work today. It's, it's interesting because we have this summer meal program. So normally when we're not in school, we still have a free meal program in the summer. We'll serve maybe 12, 1,500 meals a day. Now through this crisis that we're in, we're serving over 6,000 meals a day. And so obviously it's a need in our community. I'm, I'm thankful for our transportation staff, for our food service staff, our teaching staff. I think, I think their attitude and perspective has been wonderful. Just roll up their sleeves, from home, uh, find ways to communicate with one another virtually, connect with their students. Uh, they're doing that with all of their students each week, uh, at the very least, and, and many more often than that. Um, and and it just done some incredible things. Our, our building engineer and custodial staff, obviously right as this began, we did a lot of deep cleaning. Uh, and now they've almost moved into summer mode where they're preparing the schools again for the eventuality that we will come back. We just don't know exactly when. Right. And uh, you kind of were going into, into where my next question was. Sure. So, so thank you for that. But of, I think there's about 2,000 employees in the district, something yeah, like that? Yeah, we're at 24, okay. almost 2,500 employees in okay. the district, a little over 24. Of those, and maybe talk about um, employee groups, but what percentage on a daily basis are working in a building? What, you know, secretary, mm. Oh, right food? now? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so as we sit now. It would be, at best, in a, in a regular school building, at best, a very skeleton crew, if you will. Very few are actually working in our buildings. There are administrators who are in every building every day. There are custodial service uh, staff that are in in the buildings every day. Uh, there are not uh, just a, a full slew of, of teachers. You know, when, when this school closure came in, we also had this um, guideline put upon us by the governor of, of no more than 10 in a room and proper social distancing rules, and those are all good things that she did. Uh, and so we have made certain that nothing that we're doing uh, causes uh, you know, large groups of, of people to be together. We've got a number of staff members that are doing common planning 
curriculum writing for, for the future, uh, developing these lessons that we're handing out to students at the elementary level and digitally delivering to students at the secondary level. But all of that's being done uh, really virtually uh, with our, our great staff just doing everything they can to make it work. Okay. And have, have any of the school employees, of, of no matter what their function is, have, have do you know, has anyone tested positive for coronavirus? Yeah, we're not aware of, a, of a, an employee or a, or a student or anybody related to the district uh, that, that has tested positive at this time. Now, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, testing didn't ramp up until recently. And so I'm not saying that we, we suspect that there aren't any cases or anything. Where, frankly, we just don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things you mentioned, social distancing and, and the, you know, the groups of 10 and not wanting to exceed that. You, you have moved to probably, I don't know, three, t at least two or three school board meetings that have been online right. only. How do you feel like that has gone? And, and I think people have still called in to the meetings to, for community participation. Yeah, that's correct. At least, okay. Yeah, yeah so the, the move to the, you know, interestingly, the move to digital delivery, uh, excuse me, digital delivery uh, has been far easier, I think, for the students than it has for the adults. Uh, you know, adults typically have their way of doing things that existed maybe before technology was available. And so uh, I'm really impressed with the way our teaching staff have, have, have done that and other staff members as well. And our school board's no exception there either. I mean, the school board members uh, aren't necessarily technology experts and, and they have devices and, and those sorts of things. But I think we're all getting a whole lot better than we ever were at using a Zoom meeting or a Microsoft Teams meeting or a, a WebEx or or, you know, whatever software it might be. Um, I think that the, the biggest challenge that has occurred to school board meetings uh, hasn't necessarily been the ability for the community to watch them because actually we, we were able to roll them out online live. I, I think there's just a very short delay, matter of seconds, uh, just by the way the technology works. And so that part's been fine. I think we've, we may have more people watching our meetings now than we ever have because it's just uh, so simple to do so. It is a little tougher, I think, for the public to engage the board because we can't allow the public into the room because if you think of the seven board members and the superintendent and the board secretary and somebody running the technology, that's 10. And so we really, you know, we even, we even have to do things where if we have a different administrator coming into the room to make a presentation, someone has to leave. And so uh, we did that for, I think, one meeting, Brad, and then, and then the next meeting we started to have board members who would participate online. And so I think the last meeting we had, we had five people in the room or maybe six, something like that. If someone wants to address the board, you know, we always want to make that available to them. Uh, and so the way we're doing that now is just through the telephone. And so if someone has a comment on an agenda item or if they have a comment on something that's not on the agenda and just want to be part of citizen, citizen input, uh, they just go through the process, fill out the form. We added to the form their phone number um, because we wouldn't have asked for that before, but now we direct dial them during the meeting and then connect that phone with the intercom system that's in the room so that, so that their question or comment can be heard by all. Um, and, and you talked about the various ways that there is instruction, and I think it's important to point out that um, there is not required instruction, but it's, it's voluntary instruction, correct? Th that's correct. We really had three choices. When, when it, and this wasn't on March 16th when we closed the first time. It was actually mid-April uh, because when we first closed, uh, they just, they, the government, the, the governor and the Department of Education just waived those school days, so we weren't required to make them up. When we got to the middle of April, however, and it seemed that we were likely going to have to close for quite a long time or maybe even the rest of the year, which has now become reality, we really had three choices. The first was we could choose to do nothing, continue to do nothing, but we'd have to make up any new closed days in the summer. I don't know of any districts in the state that selected that. The second option that we had was a voluntary learning model where they would permit us then to waive the days because we made instruction available to all our students but we don't have to uh, make absolutely certain that all students are participating in that. And, and the third option was to have a required program of instruction, which um, uh, I understand from looking at data yesterday, only about 12% of the districts in the state are using a required model at any grade level. And you could do different things at different grade levels. We had a lot of people say, well, why don't you just keep, you know, all the kids have their own computers in grades six through 12. Uh, why don't you just teach them online? Well, 
Our courses weren't developed to be taught online. I believe that a teacher in the room with the students is the best way to learn. And so uh, I know our teachers believe that as well. And so we didn't necessarily have entire courses delivered online before. We also know that we've got a fair amount of our students that don't have internet connectivity, and that's pivotal in a digital environment. And we know that at the elementary level, we don't have all kids with a computer. We, we have just barely enough to give every kid a computer if, if nothing goes wrong, and so we just don't have those in the hands of the elementary kids. And so um, the required model was just not something we could do. Uh, under the state's guidelines of how you would do the required model. So uh, like 87 or 88 percent of the districts in the state, we went with the voluntary model. It allows us to waive the days. It does put a little onus on the family, uh, parents and guardians of our students, to engage those students in the voluntary model. Um, originally, I was very concerned that we wouldn't have much participation if we just made it voluntary. And that was going to be my next question. So I, since you're going out, yeah. could, could, you, could you pinpoint sure. maybe for middle school or high school or however, however you can pinpoint it, participation rates? And, and I will say I have a, a daughter who attends a different school district, right. and there was, you know, that we get emails and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, texts, and initially, I think the first week it was like 20%, and now mm -hmm. and they basically chided a bunch of parents with the, with the next email blast. <laughs> we need more, and I think it's up to like 30 or 40, which is, was not super high. Right. Do you have any stats that you can quantify? I, for I don't have any that that I would report with accuracy. Um, would, you know, when when we, but but I'll I'll try to answer the question. You know, it, it, as as we we had already rolled out the the free meal program, and we knew what our participation rates in that were because we can count them when they show up. Um, we learned quickly that the, the, the packets that we're handing to elementary kids were doing so at the meal delivery sites and we're emailing them if somebody doesn't want to come in for obvious reasons. Uh, but we serve way more meals on the days that we hand out the packets. And of course we count how many packets we hand out as well. And then on the digital side, so that's for grades 6 through 12, where we're pushing the lessons out to them digitally, we can get a little better uh, feedback on participation rates there. Uh, although it's really important to note in the state of Iowa, uh, with this voluntary system, we're not allowed to take these lessons back, to grade them, to give the students any feedback on them. Because if we do all of those things, that becomes that required instruction model that we just can't make None of, very, very few of the districts can make work unless they're very small. So I would guess we're in the neighborhood of, of exactly what you just said. If you'd asked me to just absolutely guess on a number, I'd say we're somewhere in the 40% range. Um, I can't prove it, uh, and so I just want to be very honest about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank, thank you. I, an estimate, you know, just, yeah. th that's good to have a gauge. Um, and then I guess it's kind of related to that. So there are... Uh, I think most Iowa schools typically will miss about 10 weeks, the, the, whole first, the whole last quarter and maybe another week, something like right, that. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think this was mentioned, I can't remember, at a school board by you or someone else, but sure. there are, it was incumbent on next year, the things, I guess I'm getting to the things that kids are missing out on. Right. There, there is voluntary, they're not gonna necessarily pick up everything, they're not gonna right. get 10 weeks of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it incumbent, I think is what was said, was um, that on next year, like say a fifth grade, what they're missing at the end of fifth grade, that the sixth grade teacher maybe kind of recovers the ground of that. I guess my ultimate question, if I can get to it, is no, do, do, you, do you believe with that lost learning that there could be a downtick on like standardized tests, ACTs, college entrance exam, because there's just something that, that was not getting gotten? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate the question, uh, understand it. Um, I think we will feel the negative repercussions of the academic loss for years. Okay. That's just my belief. I hope that that's not the case. That's not to say that I don't think our, our teaching staff and other staff members are, are not superheroes. They are. They're doing a lot of great things. But we have to realize the social emotional loss that's occurred through this, this as well. Um, if, if I could just give an example or two, you know, when you're at the end of your first grade year, your second semester of your first grade year. Uh, you're right, we had eight weeks that were completed and then the last week of that quarter plus the entire rest of the next quarter is gone. Um, that's when you really learn to read. I mean, learn to read in such a robust way that we can read to learn in second and third grade and so on. And similar things are happening at a higher level in second grade and so on. Uh, you know, we are creating a return to learn program right now that will have to be approved by the state. Um, we do, we've already set the calendar for the next school year, so we're planning to start on or about August 23rd. 
The governor did say you could start a little bit earlier if you want, but we have to recognize in the state of Iowa, each day of instruction on personnel costs alone, uh, $28 million. So we can't just say, well, we were going to have 180 days in, in next school year. Let's make it 200. I'd prefer to do that, but we can't afford to do that. Our taxpayers can't afford to do that either, and the state can't. So I suspect we'll still have a 180-day school year next year. I do think we'll try to reach out to some of our partners and see if we can come up with some sort of a, I don't want to we'll use too assertive of a term, but some sort of boot camp, I guess, if you will, to be, you know, before the school year begins, or, or what we'll do in the first couple of weeks of school, maybe, that are, are really items that, that needed to have been completed the previous year, so that we really can get going on this school year. And of course, all of this is predisposed on the fact that we'll start on August 23rd. I certainly hope we will, uh, for the sake of, of a lot of things, including the economy. But um, so right now, that's kind of how we're working through that system. Yeah, and you and I have talked uh, for various stories and the th times that we've talked over you know, the last several weeks of how you, you've lamented many times what, what for high school seniors missing the, the final quarter of, of their high school career. And, and you've talked about you know, the, the things that are missed and you know, a lot of the activities that you said that are no longer being held. I, I wanted to make this personal. If you could go back to your senior year, what, would it, sure. what is it, if, if you missed the last two months of your senior year, what, was, what would it be that you would most have missed that year? Oh, at that point for me, it would have been my relationships with my, with my other students that were, that were seniors with me. Okay. Um, because, you know, I, I grew up in Fremont, Nebraska, one high school town. Uh, we had worked through the elementary and middle school together. We all knew each other. It was still a fairly large graduating class, as I remember, in, in, in terms of maybe about 300, if, if I recall correctly. Uh, but we knew everybody. And uh -huh. so, you know, you get to do all of those lasts together. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't someone that, that loved the concept of prom or or uh, uh, even really a commencement <laughs> mm -hmm. exercises and those sorts of things. Uh, but I do know how important they are to our students and families. Uh, and so for me, it would have been the relationships. And, and uh, I do know that we've got to keep finding ways to acknowledge the resilience and the loss that has been felt by this senior class. I also want to mention, just because that came up, we also have a group of educators and other staff members who have been with us a long time who oh. are retiring this year. Yeah. And happen to live near one of them uh, who's just a great teacher. I, would, I don't have permission to share the name, but, but uh, just an incredible teacher. Uh, and and this, she uh, had no idea when she was an elementary, elementary teacher, had no idea on March 13th that that's the last yeah. time she got to see Hug um, teach those kids. Sure. And so I can't imagine what that feels like to her. That's got to be devastating as well after a long career in education. Okay. As we wind down, I have a couple of questions in about the activities that are gone. Sure. Um, how are the parents and students, how have they accepted the, the reality that prom has been canceled and will not be held? Yeah, you know, I think, I think the, the, the immediate decision that we made to cancel prom was uh, received negatively by some because we made it as early as we did. We didn't wait until we were a little closer to the first date of prom. But it was so obvious then that the social distancing rules were going to be in place. You know, prom is an event where there's over a thousand, in our case, over a thousand sweaty kids in a gym. And, you know, that it, there's no hope for social distancing. And so uh, to me, that, that was a no-brainer decision, even though it was hard to make it because I didn't want to frustrate those folks. Uh, we did have some conversation early on about how we might try to make up for that. And, and I've talked to parents who are running the post-prom or the after-prom committees. And I know they are planning, they've been raising money for years. They've got, you know, I, I think that they will do something alternate when it's safe to do so, if it's not so late that people just don't want to engage in their- But that would not be affiliated with the school, te technically. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah. if it's safe to do so and they want to use their gym or something like that, of course we would allow them to. But um, I, I, I just, I can't see at the moment as I'm talking to you that, you know, that's going to happen in the month of June even. And so I, I don't know when we'll be able to have that kind of a large mass gathering again. Right. Okay. So then the next, the next logical one, which we talked about, uh, is high school graduation. Oh, yeah. Just as you, as you can best describe what that conception would look like, describe what that would be, and then how, from what the community has heard of this possible plan, how, how are they accepting of that? Yeah. So, um, you know, we tried to communicate our 
commencement uh, information in small bits as, as decisions were made. Um, you know, I would, I would pose a question to the audience or, or to you, you know, uh, do you think social media is a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, where the answer is both, I'm sure, but in this case, social media was not our friend at all. Uh, no one, the school board, me, uh, administrators, teachers, no one ever intended uh, to keep a commencement exercise from these, these students and their families. Uh, we were slow at, at in, in comparison to some of our smaller school district neighbors, at communicating every detail of our plan, simply because we have, I mean, we're overwhelming in size compared to many. I mean, the, the closest district in size to us nearby is Sergeant Bluff, and they're a tenth of our size. Uh, and they're a great district. I, I mean, no disparagement to them, but with 15,000 students, 1,000 graduates, uh, you know, we can't do this in our high school. We just don't have a room big enough, and so we always rent the Tyson. And so great partners at the city, great partners with the Tyson Event Center, uh, and we, we created a couple of alternate dates. Uh, but we also pushed forward this idea that we need to do a virtual commencement because I'll tell you what, I could not win on that decision. I had people calling me saying, why in the world would you do anything on the date that the commencement's already supposed to be there, even if it's virtual? Why aren't you just waiting until later and doing it on an alternate date? And I had people, when we started talking about an alternate date, say, why in the world would you not do something when commencement's supposed to happen? It's on our calendar. It's what we're planning. Uh, and so it was one of those where, you know, when you're superintendent at times, you just can't win. And, and somebody's going to be mad no matter what you do. And I accept that. I signed up for this job. I love this job. Um, the concept of the virtual graduation uh, is that we're going to retain the reg regular date. We're going to put yard signs in every senior's um, home in their yard just to say that we're very proud that a graduate of the class lives here. Uh, they'll be able to tune into their virtual comm commencement at a specific time, but also retain it for well into the future. It'll have a lot of the same things that a regular commencement would have, although I think it'll be a little shorter in some ways. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, the superintendent will speak but I'm not going to do as much as I normally would do in, in a speech because I can personalize it in the room. Our board president will speak, the principal will speak, we'll have members of the class who will speak. Uh, and then the, the thing that I think will be better is we'll spend more time recognizing each child uh, by, I shouldn't call them child, they're graduates now, they're student, uh, with their pictures, some accomplishments, you know, those sorts of things on the screen as, as they're watching this virtual ceremony. Uh, and I think that part is, is uh, actually going to be a little better, and it's something you can retain forever. Our alternate dates, uh, June 20th is, is our first alternate date. As I sit here today, I can't imagine we'll be ready to go by then, but if we are, we've got it reserved. Our next alternate date is July 25th, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to make it happen then. But if we can't, our next plan is to say, if you'd like to come back to your school's homecoming game, football game, uh, we'll do something at halftime for those seniors of the class of 2020 who would like to have come. We're not requiring them to come, and some may, and some, I mean, I'll tell you, you asked me about my own high school. I've never been back to a football game since I, <laughs> I left. I, I, you know, and I, I know some students won't want to do that, but hopefully some would. And if, if this social distancing thing goes on for so long, we even leave open the possibility that we could recognize the class of 2020, those who would like to, in our 2021's commencement exercises, if necessary. I just want to make sure that our families know how important it is. The students want to walk across the stage. Mom and dad want to watch that. I want them to understand we want to watch that. I mean, we were a part of this journey for them, and we want to celebrate that with them. We just have to make decisions on, on doing so only when it's safe to do so. Okay, I had another last question, but yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna switch my last question. No, that's fine. Um, I, I'm hearing more scuttlebutt or um, th about the potential of a second wave of coronavirus that could mm -hmm. perhaps come in, you know, later or in, uh, late fall, winter. Um, how concerned are you that that could happen? And what do you, what would you say to health care officials or like the county, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, um, public health officials? I'm sorry, or not county. I'm sorry, the state, like the governor, right. Department of Education, as far as practices now as a way to forestall that from happening. Right. I, I will tell you that one of the concerns that I have, um, that I think about often, uh, is that we're going to start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. Uh, that we'll think it's safe and we want to get this economy rolling again. We want it, we, 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 we're not very patient people, a patient society anymore, so we'll give it a shot. And then I think Corona will rise up again and we may have to close again. Um, 
I would say to the, to the leaders uh, who, who I follow with respect, uh, please don't do it too soon. Uh, give us the opportunity to be successful and completely successful. We still don't know, as I understand it, I'm, I'm not that kind of a doctor, but we still don't know, uh, you know, how to, how to really stop this virus and what will happen to this virus in really cold months or really hot months or anything like that right now. So um, assuming this thing won't have a vaccine, um, and assuming we haven't created a testing system that, that gives us all a sense of peace and comfort in you know, just being around one another uh, that's, that's available to all, um, I worry that we'll start up again, we'll have to shut it down, we'll have to start up again, and, and it'll just become this kind of recurring problem that we have. So uh, I would say to our community members uh, that we're doing the right things right now. I know none of us like it, and it's certainly changed to our lives. But what we're doing now is an investment. It's an investment in the ability to open up uh, properly in the future. And with that, that, that ends the questions that I have for you. And I really appreciate the time then coming in and, and again, covering, that was a lot of information. That was a lot of issues and I really appreciate well, your time. Well, thanks for helping us get our story out. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.